Good evening, everyone. I'm Claudia Tobin. Um, welcome to the first in the Royal Drawing School's Spring and Summer Series of Creative Conversations this term, um, in which we explore conversations across different art forms with visual artists, art historians, poets, um, and curators. I'm really uh, delighted to welcome this evening Rebecca Compton for our exploration um, tonight of Venus's verdant virtues. Lovely alliteration in that title. Um, and we're going to be transported to Renaissance Florence into the verdant gardens of Venus um, to explore the challenges faced by Renaissance artists who were commissioned to illustrate uh, her landscapes and, and to portray a green geography that would remain evergreen. And I've really enjoyed um, conversations with Rebecca over the last year, learning from her a great deal about uh, the magic of colour in the Italian Renaissance. Um, and I'm really um, especially looking forward to um, Rebecca bringing this subject to life for us through a live um, pigment demonstration this evening. So uh, really looking forward to that. Uh, so just to uh, introduce Rebecca a little further, she is Associate Professor of Renaissance and Baroque Art at the College of Charleston. She received her PhD in the History of Art from the University of California, Berkeley and completed a Mellon postdoctoral fellowship at Columbia. She is currently um, a fellow at ITATI, uh, at the Harvard University Center for the Itali Italian Renaissance Studies. And her research addresses the interplay between vision, materials, desire, and the body. She's written on Fra Filippo Lippi, Sandra Botticelli, and Michelangelo. But tonight uh, we have the opportunity to celebrate um, Rebecca's beautiful, uh, recently published book, uh, Venus and the Arts of Love in Renaissance Florence, uh, published um, by Cambridge University Press just a couple of months ago, and I can't recommend it highly enough. So we'll um, be putting a, a discount code for that um, in the chat box, um, if any of you would like to follow up on that later. And just to mention for those of you who haven't perhaps um, tuned into the conversation series, um, this is you know, very much a conversation. Uh, we invite you to be part of it. Um, and so we'll have time for questions at the end, but you can leave comments or, or questions in the chat or Q&A box throughout, and we'll have time to discuss these at the end, or um, you can raise your hand virtually in the um, uh, participants tab. Um, and then you'll be able to talk with us directly. So um, we'll look forward to, to hearing from you all later. So Rebecca, welcome. Um, so Venus, Venus is a goddess of nature. She resides in landscapes, uh, responsive to her powers over spring and regeneration, which of course is very apt for us just now. Um, she has many attributes, which you explore in your book, uh, her golden splendor, her rosy com complexion, fashions, green gardens, erotic anatomy, and gifts from the sea. Um, tonight we're focusing on her green gardens and the, and the pigments used to evoke them. So just to start us off, could you um, set the scene for us by telling us a bit more about how Ve Venus was seen in, in Renaissance Florence and the kinds of ways uh, artists sought to represent her and manifest her virtues? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's perfect. No, I just want to thank you, Claudia, and thank you, Kat and Fraser, um, for organizing this session. Um, and I'm excited to talk to everyone tonight about um, the book and about Venus and about some of the difficulties um, artists face in actually depicting a green landscape, which now maybe it doesn't seem quite so hard to depict, but creating the atmospheric perspectives and then dealing with these quite difficult green pigments um, that we'll be learning about today um, present some interesting issues. So I'll share my screen. And okay, everybody can see that? Yep, that's perfect. Um, and I wanted in the opening slide to, to show um, Botticelli's Venus and Mars because it is located in London at the National Gallery. And soon when that reopens, it will be nice to be able to go there um, for any of you listening that are in London and to see the painting and maybe you'll understand a little bit more about um, Botticelli's process in painting it. Um, and it's really a splendidly conserved painting. And I think 
um, one of the things, this is probably the third or fourth of Botticelli's um, mythologies, and he actually is able to really use the green and to use it in a way that conserves the, the color um, more so than we'll see in some of his other um, paintings. Oops. Okay. So just um, to introduce the subject and to kind of talk a little bit maybe about an aspect of Venus that people aren't always aware of during the Renaissance, sometimes we think of Venus simply as sort of a marble um, statue or goddess who's depicted nude. Um, we might see, you know, in the Louvre or in the Vatican museums or in Rome um, and kind of imagine her in some sort of temple. Um, and that in the Renaissance, that's sort of the Venus they were recreating. And in doing research for the book, um, I was really struck by this other notion um, of Venus as a planet and as a planetary force um, and how this idea often merges um, with the ancient mythological stories and portrayals of Venus to create this um, interesting hybrid of a figure. And it's not that she's always kind of naked or nude um, and not always related to sensuality or erotic desire, but actually involved in aspects of, for example, medicine um, or um, ideas of mineralogy and that aspects um, that are earthly materials upon the earth are actually infused with the sort of planetary force of Venus. And if you look at this slide I have here, which shows us Venus as the morning star, um, and you can see, I don't know if you can see my little mouse, but right up here in the center above the moon, um, right as the moon is setting before the sun comes up, you're able to see Venus. And if you look closely, you can see the rays of light shining forth from the star. Um, and besides the moon, Venus is the only other heavenly body in the night sky that casts both reflections and shadows upon the earth. Um, and we all are quite aware of, of how the sun affects us daily um, and how the moon might affect the tides or our bodies. Um, but we rarely would think that a planet like Venus would have an effect upon us. But in the Renaissance, they were very conscious of the planets having these forces, which they believe were derived from God and sort of in a, in a macro microcosmic world, those rays coming forth from the star actually transferred certain virtues or powers to the earth and had effects on individuals. Um, so this is just uh, two objects um, prior to Botticelli that I discuss in the book that illustrate to us some of this sort of one, this strange iconography we see here. Um, this is an object that is, was used um, as a birth tray, um, which is actually a gift presented to a woman who had recently um, born a child. And usually it would be covered with a white cloth and then brought to the female to present her with um, maybe rose sugar candy or a chicken or some wine um, that she might um, then partake in following her birth. And then they would be unveiled and then the, the tray would then become a painting. Um, so in this one, we have a really unusual iconography where the artist seems to be trying to embody this planetary force um, of Venus as the brightest star um, via these rays coming out, but also placing this nude winged female in the center of this mandorla and then kneeling in this garden. And we can also see in this painting um, one of these early representations of a garden. Um, and kneeling in this garden are six legendary lovers like Lancelot, um, Samson, Paris, and um, they're receiving sort of this, this golden splendor of Venus, which will then cause them to be fall in love and, and also in some ways become prisoners of love. And um, kind of rudiment, not rudimentary, but kind of a very early portrayal here of a garden. And we see the green and the green mixed with yellow placed against a darker um, ground. And one more before we jump into the Botticelli, this is another example of where we would find a depiction of Venus, for example, on a, a cassone or a wedding chest. Um, this would be a painting that would not normally be seen every day by individuals unless the chest was opened. Um, and once opened, 
um, you could have a view of this female figure. And in this chapter, I discuss um, the earliest nude portrayals of Venus and how they relate to different skincare concerns um, that were expected of females and cleanliness and forms of the body. Um, and also um, these just a different form of, of an object before we get to the much more um, larger scale paintings of um, Botticelli. So should I go ahead and uh, I'll go ahead and kind of introduce you to the, the Botticelli um, paintings and then we'll look um, at these different aspects of the garden. Um, one thing that's kind of important to recognize with the Botticelli paintings a bit is that they are really the earliest paintings to represent these mythological figures and scenes on a large scale. Um, this painting of the Primavera is around, um, I think, seven and a half by close to 11 feet. So we have very, very large painting. Um, and there's a transition as we move from a kind of smaller birth tray um, or a long cassone panel that you have to get on the ground to peer at to these, these massive paintings that take up major um, space within the room and also introduce this kind of verdant garden imagery um, into the space of the bedchamber or the camera um, or different rooms within the domestic interior. There's a very, very different in, in relation to the, oh, sorry, my sound okay there? Yeah, I can hear you now. Sorry, the sound went a bit funny. No, I was just thinking there's, it's such a different um, interaction with uh, the works and with, with Venus um, in that shift you know between those portrayals that you were showing of um venus on the wedding chess and um the cassone and in, in in the paintings and just i think you know you discuss in the book um that relationship between fertility and venus and kind of bringing her into the heart of the home into these sort of private spaces so there's a yeah interesting uh relationship there that i think you know you bring out in your book don't you Right, and then, um, you know, from these smaller scenes to these larger ones, I've been struck because my five-year-old, whenever I, we talk about this painting or look at it, she's always very scared of the wind god in this painting um, that's flying in and sort of taking um, the nymph Chloris and then through his interaction with her will allow her to transform into Flora, the goddess of flowers. But this in itself is, you know, rather kind of risque and possibly somewhat violent imagery to show um, in a painting like this. And it was also, um, you know, I think problematic. There were tensions in representing a mythological figure who was also once a pagan goddess mm -hmm. on this scale um, and bringing them into the house. And, and later following, um, you know, the, the move of the Medici out of Florence and Savonarola into Florence, he will condemn these types of paintings and say, you know, young children shouldn't be exposed to the nude females and that, you know, we must be careful of kind of idolatry in these images. So it is a kind of fine line. We can look at it in, for, in the form of this kind of beautiful mythology, this fable, this story that's not real. Um, but there was during this period, it's particularly um, with aspects of things like astral magic and the idea of drawing these planetary powers to your own uses um, that could kind of cross um, some of those lines. Mm. Yeah, and I, I know we touched before on uh, on the kind of the not just the the, the um, mythical but also the kind of literary sources that um, that were you know sources for 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 these artists in their in their visual rep representations and you know the allegorical gardens of love in in um french literature of the 12th and 13th centuries and um i just yeah do you, do you want to touch on that at this point or um yeah i'll just talk about it um, for a second before getting into some of the other kind of virtues of these green spaces mm -hmm. um going back to the fifth century um with the roman poet claudian we get one of the earliest descriptions of this island of Venus, and it's um, quite notable for all of the green imagery that we find in it. Um, he describes, for example, of this um, kind of soft green meadow, um, that there is an actual kind of grove of evergreen trees that emanates a green gleam from Venus's palace, which is built 
from green stones like jasper and emerald and aquamarine. Um, so very early on, there's this idea of kind of this green emanation of light that you might find in a kind of Venusian space or um, in this garden that he describes. And medieval and then Renaissance poets pick up this imagery and we see it kind of repeated but also elaborated on um, in the Romance of the Rose, which is a chivalric medieval French story um, where we have this, this garden where the rose is protected. And then there's a description um, that says that in this place as much grass as possible grew um, and that one could in a kind of erotic way lay one's mistress down upon the soft green grass as if upon a feather bed. Um, so this imagery, this poetic imagery that we see I think influences um, not only the artistic representations of some of these spaces but also the patrons desire to also to possess them. Um, and one poet who kind of gives us reveals the tensions of this kind of green space is Petrarch. Um, and in his um, triumphs, and particularly in his triumph of love, he sort of questions um, the virtues, we might say, of green places and says that instead these kind of evergreen spots that are, are soft and tender can be emasculating. Um, and that instead of, of bringing one virtue, they can actually promote vices like falsehood or lust um, or avarice. And so we also see some of these sort of more uh, kind of tensions and questions and problems of the Venusian space also appear in art. So for example, what we're looking at um, now on the screen is another birth tray. And again, these are about probably about this um, large in size um, and presented again to a female following usually the birth of a child. And here we see um, this representation of the green um, description that we find also in Petrarch of these, this kind of beautiful soft green place. But in the foreground, we see examples of how this place could be emasculating. So we see an image at the very bottom here, this nude male laying on the ground as Samson um, and Delilah is cutting his hair. Um, Samson being a biblical figure who became so enamored by the female that he didn't realize her power over him and then she cut his hair. Um, so, and he was also known as the strongest man. So here we see love conquering kind of the strongest um, of men. And then um, to, you know, our left, we also see Aristotle being ridden um, by Phyllis, a female, and we have a kind of example of the wisest man who's also been taken by love. Um, so for Petrarch, this is a questionable place um, and not always kind of in the kind of highest praise. Um, but one thing we see by the time of um, Botticelli, there is also this kind of renewal of um, kind of praise for the green places. And even in the poetry of Lorenzo de' Medici, who may have commissioned this painting, um, we find him, you know, a poem that says, come Venus to Florence, you know, come to where the rivulet bathes these um, tender blades of green. And he talks about this, the kind of greenness of Florence and for Venus and love to come into this place. Um, and in some of these paintings by Botticelli, particularly one we'll look at in a minute, um, we actually see her in a green space with a contemporary bride um, of the Tornaboni. So um, it's a, a kind of interplay between these positive and negative aspects um, of her in poetry. Thank you. Yeah, it's really fascinating to hear about the, the sort of Venetian virtues sort of being imbued into the, the language of poetry and the language of color really too, yeah. So um, should we move on to, to thinking about sensorial medicine? Is that, is that a good place to go next? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was really, I've been really intrigued by, um, you know, the medicinal, pharmacological, therapeutic properties um, associated with, with certain pigments and particularly with green. Um, mm -hmm. You know, thinking particularly of um, uh, the, the Renaissance philosopher Marsilio Piccino and his three books on life and the way in which he um, dedicates the colour green and gardens to Venus and the, the, the kind of health giving properties he associates with green. So maybe you can touch on that. Yeah. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second before, especially before we see the green pigments. Yeah. 
Um, so I was really kind of struck at, in approaching the landscapes of Venus um, by this connection of green spaces and green places to these health giving kind of salubrious virtues that one might imbibe through the eyes or um, even more specifically some of these green materials dating back to antiquity were actually used um, medicinally um, and in pharmacological practice. So um, Aristotle, for example, says that malachite here, which we see in the lower right of the screen, this kind of seafoam bright green color, um, that it cost more than gold um, because it was a drug used for the eyes. Um, and Pliny, who wrote his natural history um, book, which gives us a, a whole host of information on different materials, he says that verdigris, which is this um, pigment opposite, the kind of turquoise teal pigment, um, that it could be used to treat glaucoma, um, cataracts, ulcerations of the eye, or problems with the eyelids. Um, so in reading this, I was kind of immediately struck by this connection between green um, and green materials and their benefits um, for the eyes. And so um, as I began to look a bit more, um, I found even further kind of examples and descriptions of this. Um, Pliny, for example, says that if your eyes are tired and they do tedious work, um, like gym cutting, that you should um, take a break and look upon an emerald and it will restore your vision and restore your eyesight. Um, and Hildegard of Bingen, who was an, an 11th century nun, but also a great writer on kind of med medicinal practice, says that if you're having problems with your eyes, that you need to go out into a green meadow and the moisture from the green will enter your eyes and will cure them and soothe them and kind of restore one's vision. And so this seemed to have an, a, a, a very close connection to this popularity of the green landscapes that not only occurred around the 1450s in this mythological art, which for the first time was made on a grand scale, but we also find it in the religious art of the period where we see a transition from the gold ground of the altarpiece, this very bright golden reflected light um, to a, a solid green um, landscape. And that, that, that there was an actually a kind of beneficial um, kind of role of the color and a beneficial interaction between the eyes of the viewer um, and the surface of the painting um, and how that green entered um, the eye. So with Ficino, who's um, writing his book, The Three Books on Life, at the same time that Botticelli is painting his various um, paintings of Venus, um, describes very um, concretely and specifically these three aspects of green, which make it beneficial um, not only to the eyes, but also to the spirit. Um, he says that this youthful spirit flows to humans through the odor even of green things, the sight and the use and habitation um, of the body in a green place. Um, and he says that this occurs for three reasons. One is that green is a temperate color. So it's between um, like white and yellow or gold, which causes um, the rays of the eyes and the pupils to kind of open up and dilate. Um, and it's between that brightness and then black, which causes the pupils to contract. And so that temperate quality of green really gives an even, smooth, kind of peaceful um, effect on the eyes and the way that the pupils interact with the color green. Um, he also says that green is soft and tender um, and that green things, I guess, are often soft and tender and that this texture calms and soothes the rays of the eyes. Um, and then thirdly, he links green to water and to moisture. Um, and if we think about it, it makes sense, right? Um, after rains mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when there is moisture in the air, things turn green. Um, if a plant doesn't receive any water and it dries up, it will no longer be green. Um, and with some medicinal um, descriptions, you know, the human body is described as having an inner viridity or greenness. Is this, this is the body's fertility. Um, and it was quite known very well then that not only did you need moisture for your eyes to function well, but also um, for pregnancy and for fertility and um, for the caring of a child. So we often see this idea of fertility intermingled with the idea of vision um, and the role of green in promoting kind of the, the, the health of both of those aspects of the human.
Mm, fascinating. I mean, it feels so, you know, just thinking about how much people in the last, you know, particularly over the last year have, have um, dwelt in and experienced green spaces as restorative spaces. You know, I just wonder how much is, has kind of been investigated by, you know, contemporary therapeutics and, and kind of, you know, studies of physiology um, now, you know, in relation to the kind of curative properties of green. Um, something, you know, as well that was quite important for these Florentines, um, particularly, you know, when aspects of the, I mean, when like kind of uh, periods of the plague would come into the city center, um, they would want to, you know, go out into the hills, go to Fiesole, go to Cavalli, go to this ocean to find these kind of green spaces. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that we see um, around this, this time period as well as the idea of, of trying to bring these green spaces or these greenery inside of the house uh, because you can't always, you have to do business in, in, in town. Um, many times you have to be in the city in your palazzo um, in the center and you can't necessarily be out in the country all the time. And so how can we, you know, I think this is, these are some of the questions they ask, how can we bring that green inside of the house? Um, and so that was something I looked at to see how green could be brought in besides being out in green with actual live plants. Um, and because of their ideas on how um, color entered the eye, um, it, there was a sense that the same green light that you might get from a garden versus the green kind of light or rays of color that might come to your eye from a painting, that they could have similar effects um, on the body and on the humors. Um, so if, if I'll talk a second about some of the ways that green was brought into um, the domestic interior before um, the large scale panel paintings um, that use these, these more expensive copper green pigments. Um, and so one way, um, particularly during the kind of the 1300s and early 1400s, um, but even, even later than that like into the 16th century, we find one way of bringing green into the domestic interior is through the art of fresco, um, and particularly frescoing an entire room um, in green. And um, Kat Katarina Stahlbuck is doing, has been researching and writing a book on, on this very thing and looking at these monochrome paintings um, using green earth and how they, they can be visually stimulating. And for these frescoes, um, most of the frescoes, as well as recommendations for creating these types of frescoes, um, they are done with not with the more expensive greens that we're going to um, see it in a moment in the demonstration, but really with these cheaper earth greens, um, which we might say are these more old, these older, more ancient pigments. But they're also pigments that sometimes didn't have the same medicinal properties as the kind of malachite or verdigris. Um, and, and part of that I think comes from their ability to reflect light because this is an earth pigment is much more kind of like a dirt or sand, it's not a mineral. Um, and so it doesn't have the kind of reflective properties that we find in some of these other pigments. Um, but Cennini um, who wrote his, his Libro dell'arte, his book of art, he gives one um, kind of directions describing the painting of a room with green earth. Um, and it's quite an interesting recipe or, or set of directions because he's, he tells the painter to um, paint like three or four layers of green earth on the wall and then to make kind of some designs or some shadows and black and then to dip a sponge in honey and water and to then like press the sponge against the wall to kind of create texture and then to go back in with either white or black and kind of design a few figures. But he, he seems to kind of also describe this as an easy way of creating a green space. And it also would have been um, a somewhat cheaper way because it was painted a secco, not in true fresco, on, on already dried plaster and then using um, this pigment of the green earth. And we can see here, I'm going to show you a couple of different prices, um, but a pound of green earth cost around four soldi. Um, and an artisan's um, salary would have been around 35 florins a year or about 4,200 um, soldi per year. So you can see how this would be a kind of relatively cheap pigment, 
although you're going to need a lot of it um, to paint an entire um, room with this, this form of fresco. And one other form of greenery that we see prior to um, these large scale panel paintings um, using the copper green pigment is, are, are these tapestries. Um, and they become really popular in Florence during the 15th century. And um, part of that is due to new methods for dyeing and creating the color green. Also, it is due to the Medici connections um, that they have with Antwerp um, and Belgium, where they're quite famous for producing um, these tapestries. So here in this um, painting, this is a fresco by Domenico Ghirlandaio, and we see this is the birth of, of St. John the Baptist, but we can see in the background two of these green tapestries, this one large scale green tapestry um, that's just a solid green. This type of tapestry could be produced in Florence, and the city itself was very well known for its production of silk and wool um, materials and textiles. And then over the door um, to the right here, um, we can see a, another tapestry, this one with imagery that, that kind of indicates that it would be a vendor tapestry, meaning that it would have plants or flowers um, woven into the designs. And before we move to this, I just want to show you that this female that we see here carrying this tray um, to Elizabeth, who's just had um, John the Baptist, this would be one of those birth trays and how it would be covered with a white cloth and then you could remove the cloth and you actually have a painting um, underneath that drapery. Um, and just to kind of give you a sense of the price, one of the things I was just totally struck by were how expensive these tapestries were um, and, and what went into dyeing them because there's actually no natural material that will create a green dye. And there was a lot of kind of hesitancy for dyers or painters to mix colors. Um, one, there was sort of this idea of the purity of a material um, and not mixing the material or the colors. Um, but there was also the issue of trying to create kind of the same color over and over again from these materials that often themselves produce different shades of their own color. Um, so if we look down at the bottom, I have an image of woad, which is one of a plant material used to produce blue, indigo also used for blue, and then we have um, saffron, which can produce a bright yellow, but sometimes it's kind of mellow yellow, um, and then sumac, which is another material used by dyers. Um, it was also difficult for dyers to create green because they were often separated by colors in their workshop. So you had dyers who just worked in red or dyers who just worked in blue. Um, so this mixing of colors was kind of problematic um, and it also cost more money. Um, and I was surprised to see that a pound of silk, for example, dyed green brown, um, cost the same as a pound of silk dyed in Kermes, which was the most expensive sort of crimson velvet um, that you would, you would find um, in Florence. And here I've got just another set of numbers, which is that um, this panel painting that's in the inventory of the Medici household, um, Lorenzo di Pier Francesco de' Medici, um, that most some, some scholars identify it as being the Primavera. It is listed um, for, and I've transferred this into soldi, but 2,000 soldi for the panel painting. Um, possibly the Primavera, whereas one tapestry was worth 7,200 soldi. So these tapestries were worth way more, you know, three times as much as a painting by Botticelli of a similar size. So it kind of gives us a sense that this um, was a very kind of elite art form as well. Um, and we see that these tapestries were used not only in the bedroom, um, for the birth of a child, but they also seem to appear quite often in representations of marriage and marital feasts, which are also Venusian and kind of channeling that spirit of fertility um, to the bride. Um, and in this case, we see um, the bride sitting against one of these Vidur tapestries produced um, in the north, um, northern countries. So um, we can just now take a look at these pigments. Um, with Botticelli, when we have him kind of now producing panel paintings, the same size, 
um, as the tapestries. And for these panel paintings, the artists are not using the earth pigments, um, but really be they begin to experiment um, with the copper-based pigments. And sometimes those experiments can lead to a kind of darkening of the panel. Um, they're working between, as well at this, at this point in time, between working with tempera, um, which is egg yolk, um, or working with oil. And um, mm -hmm. in Botticelli's paintings, a lot of times um, the restorers have found that he seems to be working with both mediums and beginning to explore um, the kind of benefits and virtues of working with oil versus the egg tempera. Um, That's really fascinating, that transition, isn't it? That, that moment of, of transition, yeah. working in both media. And I, I am really interested by that question of the kind of instability of color and how color you know, it seems to be at the heart of this desire to make the image eternal. And yet mm -hmm. it's so, um, it's so, well, so uh, unstable, so, um, so difficult to, to fix, um, to, to make the, you know, as you're saying, the, to make the green evergreen and, and knowing that these pigments, I mean, I wonder how much the artists did, were aware of how the pigments um, might change over time, might fade, you know, was and, there an awareness? And they did know, I mean, at, at least, for example, Cennini in his Libro dell'arte, which is a sort of artist handbook written around the 1390s, um, he says that, you know, verdigris makes a beautiful green for grass, the absolute best, but it doesn't last. And so he's already warning the painter, painters that these colors, you know, what are the problems, what might happen? Um, and I think um, the restorers of the Botticelli's Primavera found, it was restored in 1987, but found that Botticelli used malachite, which we'll look at in a second, but that he also glazed the colors with verdigris. And verdigris has like a really unstable character to it, um, particularly in this mid part of the century. It gets better by the 16th century. Um, but it, it it's likely that this painting, all that beautiful green was what's once much more vivid mm. in the Primavera. And that this darkening, one of the reasons we see this darkening has been from the verdigris glaze. Mm. Um, These are imaginative color vision. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so let's take a look um, at the pigments. And uh, so I'm gonna stop the, well, really fast, I'll just show you. Um, before I, I grind the pigments and show you how they work differently, um, just point out like a couple of quick, quick points. Um, malachite, which I've been mentioning several times, um, artists really were drawn to it because naturally it has this kind of vivid, almost emerald green color, the color of fresh grass and the, the color that has that kind of vivid quality to it. Um, and we find malachite in copper mines. Um, it's sort of an off product of the copper and it grows alongside um, azurite and, and the malachite itself is a copper carbonate. Um, so it's a stone that's formed. Um, and then verdigris is um, also from copper, um, but it is produced by exposing copper plates to um, an acidic substance like vinegar, um, and the copper itself rusts, um, and you may have seen this if you have copper at, around your house that rusted, um, or if you think about bronze statues that have the green patina, um, that comes from like the rusting of copper, which produces this kind of turquoise color. Um, so the verdigris comes from the copper plates, it's been scraped, and then is used as a pigment, but it's also extremely unstable. Um, and then malachite also comes from copper, but it has to be mined um, out, particularly in the Black Forest of Germany, um, you know, kind of pulled from the earth and then kind of exported or imported into Italy and then crushed and used as a material. And one of the interesting things that I've, I found in this kind of their ideas of this kind of cosmological correspondences is that copper is the metal that is kind of most associated with the planet Venus. Um, and that the planet Venus also governs malachite and, and these greens that come from copper. So they actually could see this kind of interesting kind of play between the material, the astrological influence and the sensorial benefit of the material, you know, upon vision or the eyes. Mm. Um, so I'll show you these um, pigments. I'm gonna just grind them and make them into a paint. And 
And that way you can kind of see a little bit of the characteristics um, of each and why they might be difficult to paint with. Let me stop that share. Okay. Um, to have you do this in, in sort of live. Uh, how, where where did you obtain your pigments? I know there's there's uh, Rebecca's in Florence right now, and there's several really wonderful kind of apothecary shops where you can buy these these pigments. And both and of these um, came from Zeki's. Yeah. Um, also, you can go to Dr. Bizzari and he has some, some interesting pigments, um, so you can get those there as well. Mm -hmm. So we'll start here um, with the malachite and. Even if you can kind of hear it, well, you can't hear it that well. <laughs> but I wanted to show you that it has a sound like kind of like little. Oh, yeah. So that you can hear little particles. It's not like a soft mm -hmm. kind of sand. Um, so I'm going to take it. Let's see. And here you can see the color up there. And put it here. Um, so to make uh, tempera malachite, you take the color, you can see how it's not really clumping together. It's very sandy. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing that makes it difficult to paint with, can you see that? Let's see, maybe. Yeah, that's perfect, yeah. That's good. Um, is that it keeps that granular quality to it. It doesn't actually melt or bind um, with egg or oil. Um, so now I'm just going to take this egg. Yeah, it really kind of alerts us to the, the sensorial properties, the this, this sort of demonstration, you know, and the, the binding with egg, you know, it's, it's um, yeah, really fascinating to see. And with the egg, I mean, one thing that makes the egg a little bit, you know, kind of difficult in terms of of, of painting is that it dries very, very quickly. Yeah. You have to grind your pigments and work with them immediately. You can't save your paint at all. Um, and so that in itself, you know, leads to a certain form of painting where the drawing has to be, um, you know, the design has to be prepared for the paint and because you're not allowed to rework um, the color on the surface of the canvas um, and it dries so quickly and it's hard to layer it um, with the egg-based paints. So in order to do the tempera, we start here with an egg. We've got our pigment on the glass plate um, and you grind, for tempera, you grind the pigment with water. So I'm taking a little water here and adding it to the green. And when I grind it with this Mueller, you can kind of hear like a little bit of scratching sound. You can kind of tell that this pigment, you know, comes from a crushed stone that otherwise is not been manipulated. So you kind of hear that. Yeah. And what's hard with the malachite is that every, you know, when the painter is working with it, and there's a little tiny stone that just like popped out. You're, they, when they paint, they basically are, have to spread this, you know, crushed stone across the surface of something without it ever becoming the paint. It's almost like spreading a glitter across another surface. So one of the things they had to do was often put another color behind the malachite, either black or yellow, um, to try to help support the color because it was not strong enough or opaque enough in and of itself. Um, so. There's a great kind of depth to their their color knowledge or the not the knowledge of how those different pigments would interact or change each other. It's really right. mm. and some cut like the verdigris can't mix it with lead white. It has problems with uh, certain other colors, um, and so it can be even more um, problematic. This is one for uh, someone's commented that it's like a, a cooking show, which it rather is. <laughs> sort of tempting to say, try this, try try this at home. Yeah, you just have to be careful with the um, the more, you know, poisonous pigment. Uh, exactly. Um, so here I'm just putting the color and you can see how it does though make the paint and it is a really beautiful green color. Um, interestingly, it's not a popular color really until this transition to the panel paintings and really until 
you see it used, for example, you know, it really starts being used in illuminated manuscripts around the 1420s and 30s, but before that they're using a kind of different form um, of green where they're trying to mix like a yellow with a blue, but it doesn't always work quite so well. So I'm putting this and now I'll add the egg, which will create more of a binder. And usually you put about half and half egg to pigment. Um, and then I'm gonna mix those. Yeah. It's really, yeah, wonderful to see the, the, the transformation. And you can still hear, right? Yeah. This, this grinding sound, which as a painter, you want like a very smooth, soft paint, um, you know, if you can have one. Um, so like ultramarine blue makes this really beautiful, soft paint, the paint that's opaque, vermilion does as well. So I'm going to take a little of that and paint with it so you can see what color and how it looks on the. And if you let this sit, you know, for 10, 15 minutes, all the pigment um, descends to the bottom. Mm -hmm. And it, so it doesn't, again, it doesn't stay mixed into the paint. Um, so here you can see how you have this beautiful green. It is a sort of like a mint seafoam green. You can also see how those little particles separate. Mm -hmm. and that there's not a solid, solid depth of, of, of color or solid band of color. So that's malachite. Now I'll show you with um, how the verdigris works. So it is, the good thing about working with tempera is that you can clean your materials quite easily. Um, so I'm just going to clean this Mueller grinder and this. And and this, kind of, this sort of technical art history must have really illuminated for you, you know, thinking around uh, the technique that your artists were using. You know, it must have really... Um, to find the correspondences then between like copper and greens and Venus and all the poetic imagery was mm. kind of felt magical in and of itself. Yeah, I was going to say what well, I was going to ask, how, you know, have, are you under the spell of Venus? How, how much have you been enchanted by her? Well, I have for quite a while. Now I'm kind of switching modes and I'm studying the Camaldolese monks and, um, and their kind of spiritual forms of art. And um, it's been fun to kind of move to like a new space and new set of materials. So this, you can kind of, hopefully you can see it a little bit. I mean, I was amazed when I first saw this color that they even had this color in the Renaissance because it looks like a very modern color. Um, it may be hard, but you might can see it's, it's actually very much like a cr crystalline. So you can see little glimmers of light sort of crystally on it because of the crystals that form on the copper plate um, when they are exposed to um, vinegar. And because of that, because of this kind of crystal form, Chanini recommends actually um, grinding the pigment in vinegar. So I've got a little bit of white wine vinegar and because that actually does with um, the verdigris help it to kind of melt or dissolve. Um, unlike the malachite, which just won't, it won't dissolve. So I'm putting a little bit of vinegar here and then Clean. I'm going to grind this. Now you can hear how much smoother that is, right? Than that kind of rocky sound. Um, and I'm not going to be able to grind it really long enough to get it um, fully, fully kind of blended um, or dissolved into the vinegar. Now, one of the things with the verdigris, and this is the kind of issue with painters as they're trying to figure things out, is that it doesn't do very well in egg. Um, and it really, because it's, it, it creates a transparent or tran uh, yeah, transparent um, pigment, it works much better in oil. So as the artists are beginning to kind of learn how to work with oil, they start working with the verdigris. Um, and even though it's, it's quite an unstable pigment, um, they want to work with it and they're kind of trying um, their hardest. And we'll see in a second a painting um, by Pulaiwolo, where the greens have all just turned brown um, and he had bound it with um, the verdigris with oil. Um, so if you take that, this color, I think it's just such a 
pretty color. And I know you can imagine these artists wanting to paint with it, but if they knew that their landscapes were going to turn from green to brown, um, you know, you'd really have to kind of make a decision about whether it was worth painting with this if your color was going to change. Yeah, and I suppose color is, is associated with you know, well, it was traditionally, wasn't it, associated with the feminine and the sort of the seductive, the changeable, the fleeting versus designer or drawing and the kind of masculine uh, properties of, of drawing. It's, it's um, yeah, it's interesting how those associate. Well, that's one of the reasons that, uh, that because it actually changes um, mm -hmm. colors that I think it becomes associated with, um, you know, the feminine. Mm -hmm. and, has a, some of those qualities. Mm -hmm. So here I am going to use oil. This is linseed oil because this color just does not work much at all in tempera. And probably, you know, with either the verdigris or um, the red lake that they also use, which is a transparent pigment, this is probably, you know, kind of some of the first interactions that artists were having with oil that led them to use oil more often. Um, so before oil becomes a mainstream medium, they are using it quite early with these lakes, um, these transparent pigments that really need the oil as the binder um, to work. Okay, so I'm stirring that up. The crystals are not perfectly dissolved, but I'll give you, it'll give you a sense of how this color works. And here again is that malachite, but look how, oh, you know, the stroke mm. is not super smooth. So you can wow. see a Wonderful. bit more, Thank you. Um, and see how it kind of does a, like a, a, it's still transparent, but it does create a kind of smoother, maybe color um, mm -hmm. than the malachite. Um, so now we can kind of just take a second, I don't know how much time we have, but to look at, at how Botticelli uses um, these, these pigments yeah. um, in his paintings. So. Okay. Oops. There we go. Um, so here we're back to the Venus and Mars, um, and he's trying to create this, you know, very lush um, space with as much grass as possible. Um, and so we see him, you know, working with these pigments, mostly with the malachite. Um, if we zoom in um, to a detail, we can see how he's painted these little strokes of green grass. Um, using the malachite and following what Chimini says, which is to create a kind of dense appearance of a green grass that you should paint these strokes of malachite on a black or dark ground. Um, so we can see that he's using the black underneath and then painting with malachite and then with highlights in either yellow, like a lead and yellow, or um, in white. But he can't, to, in order to give us a sense of kind of this this, this atmosphere, this perspective, this space of green that's not just this tiny little patch of grass, he has to change his technique. Um, so behind the figures, as he attempts to show us, for example, this long kind of field of green grass that leads, you know, up to the city. There's like a small silhouette of Florence in the background that leads to this city. Um, he has to change his technique. So instead of painting the Malachite on black, he actually paints it on yellow um, and creates really smooth, soft strokes, maybe you know, with a little bit of verdigris glaze in places to kind of heighten um, the green color. Um, but in doing that and kind of allowing the color to transition more towards yellow, he creates this effect of distance. Um, and that's something that also you know, is, I guess, enhanced by his own studies of perspective um, and the new interest in naturalism so that you get this kind of vista um, that he's creating of the green. And I show you this, this is a sample taken not from um, the Venus and Mars, which has not been um, majorly restored in London. It's been stayed in really great shape. Um, but I show you this, this is a sample um, taken from the birth of Venus. But you can see those little jagged squares kind of embedded in the yellow. Those little jagged squares are the shards of malachite. 
um, and that's how they kind of break up and appear in a, a kind of a microscopic section um, of the pigment. So there we can see you know, him kind of using these de techniques um, to paint the space. Now, one thing that happens, here's another um, fresco that, that Botticelli paints of Venus presenting these flowers um, to the Tornaboni bride. Um, and this was a, a, in their kind of bedroom suite. But we can see how in fresco, this green has sort of eventually kind of flaked off and how it looks like they're standing just on a solid black ground, like a black um, floor, um, instead of a, a you know, flourishing verdant garden space. And how, so that could be problematic when, it, when the pigment itself flakes off and it hasn't bound well and you've painted it on black um, and you kind of lose the aspect of, um, of that aspect of the vegetation um, itself and the garden. Um, in the Primavera, we see that Botticelli also uses this um, same technique of painting the vegetation and the grass and the flowers along the ground on a black ground. Um, and that over time, that black ground has sort of started to push the green away. Um, and that knowing he also used the verdigris glaze to kind of add probably these beautiful viridescent um, aspects and different shades of green to the landscape. Um, how the darkening of that verdigris glaze is actually caused a darkening of the entire landscape. And here we can see an example, this is by um, Antonio Polaiuolo, um, a depiction of Apollo and Daphne, but this was painted in verdigris and oil. Um, and we can see how this once verdant landscape looks really kind of similar to like a muddy swamp or just kind of a, a kind of barren, um, kind of not necessarily like a verdant spring landscape. Um, and so some of that, but not too bad, probably has occurred um, with this, with the Primavera painting itself. Wonderful. Do you want to, before we sort of open up to, to, to questions from everyone listening, do you want to just take us a bit further into the, the sort of context of the Florentine or Tuscan garden and, um, you know, those links with the creation of real gardens at the time? Yes. Uh, and I'll show you just a few, there's a few photographs I took of yeah. Tuscan fields of flowers. Um, like very envious. <laughs> you left just right before, but hopefully yeah. you'll be able to come back up. Um, and one thing I was struck is that there actually are, I mean, I mean, I guess maybe where I'm from in America, we don't have quite these fields of flowers or like a green grass that's just covered with tiny daisies, like it literally is a bed of daisies. Um, and so seeing that in person helped me to see really how Botticelli gathered um, examples surrounding him um, and out in the Florentine countryside to create the painting. Um, and scholars have shown that there are over 500 plants in the painting with 42 um, different flowering species um, and like 72 ferns uh, or um, kind of green non-flowering. So here's this um, kind of field of these tiny white daisies uh, with my five-year-old in the background. But if you look in the foreground here, you can see that little tiny daisy and how it can cover the green grass. And then here's another um, image of a field near San Martino where it's just filled with these yellow um, flowers. And then another one here at the Tati where we see these, these colorful anemones, these purples and pinks. Um, that literally just go across an entire field. And so when we return to um, Botticelli's painting and look up close, we can see, for example, these small little daisies, um, these anemones, and these yellow flowers, particularly these yellow flowers that are all over Flora's dress, um, kind of brought to life as Flora is sort of inseminated by the wind or kind of this florification process. And then Flora, the goddess of flowers, once she marries the West Wind, then um, kind of flows forth and kind of metamorphoses herself into the goddess of flowers and then fills the earth in the springtime um, with flowers. So we see here Botticelli and, you know, later Botticelli sort of critiqued by Leonardo da Vinci as like not being able to do perfect landscapes or more inventive landscapes. But what um, Botticelli is doing is he's trying to show this variety of nature in these plants and to 
um, kind of depict these individual species all together at once in one garden. Um, and for example, he depicts all three types of the roses that were then known. Um, so you have an alba, white rose, the damascene, pink rose, and the gallica, red rose. And these were the primary three roses um, types that you would find because there had not been the kind of roses we know now that are more like tea roses or other forms of roses. And so he's very specific. Um, we can see in this Gallica rose of the red rose that he's depicting the exact characteristics of the rose um, you know, in his painting. But he's still kind of learning about how to kind of translate the, that naturalism into a naturalistic space and then to work um, with these green pigments and to show all these plants flowering at once. Um, including the little orange blossom flowers that we see up in the trees, this huge spray of myrtle um, that's also located behind Venus and associated with her as well as, as having these sort of aphrodisiacal powers and being used in different forms of medicines. Um, and then to kind of spread this across the whole um, format of the painting. You can see how closely this can be tied into the tapestries though that he seems to be in some ways imitating. Yeah, his, it seems that the, this sort of really highly developed kind of botanical knowledge, it, it seems so closely connected to the to the kind of color sense and, you know, that attentiveness to the hues of the petals and mm -hmm. really, um, really lovely to have that kind of drawn um, into closer focus. Um, you know, it's such a well known painting, but you um, you really bring it alive in a in a new way. Um, I think at this point we should open up to questions because time is is flying. We we. It might be enchanted, but we we can't. Um, yeah. So um, so uh, just looking here, um, I, and please do feel free to um, to raise your hand if you'd like to um, speak directly or ask a question directly. Um, but uh, one of the early questions we had was around um, the relationship between Venus and the Virgin Mary in Botticelli's painting. Mm -hmm. So perhaps you could speak to that. Yeah, so. Um... You know, there, there have been kind of many scholars discussing this appearance of her in the, this particular outfit. Um, and this is one thing I look at very closely in the book is where this kind of garments that she wears comes from, come from, why do they kind of remind us that they're different from the Virgin Mary. For example, Mary has a blue mantle and usually a red dress. Here, Venus has this kind of sheer white silk dress. She does also have a white silk veil. She has a red mantle rather than a fully blue mantle. And then she usually has this kind of gold, either designs or golden jewelry, um, usually connected with her like magical cestus or little belt um, that enchants anyone who sees it and makes them fall in love with her. And that's a mythological sort of attribute of her. Um, but one of the interesting things I found is that this, this kind of iconography of Venus in this particular outfit, which appears in several of Botticelli's paintings and a number of the workshop paintings, seems to have um, a very old origin in imagery describing a celestial images of Venus as a planet um, and relates to, in some ways, these forms of image-based magic where you can make a talisman um, with a particular image of Venus and that image could kind of have this kind of ability and its likeness to kind of translate the kind of uh, virtues or powers of that planetary force um, to someone in its vicinity through the depiction of this kind of planetary deity, we might say, um, and by closely following the iconography. And this is where, you know, Ficino, who's describing this portrayal of Venus, and using this magic book called the Pictrix, he's on like kind of, you know, he's there's some tension there and some issues of him being accused of heresy um, and idolatry for writing about these things. Um, and we wonder, you know, how close with Botticelli's portrayal of her where we can kind of see this almost deity quality in her appearance and her similarity, with similarities to the Virgin Mary, also to figures like Isis how this might be treading a kind of fine line and whether he felt comfortable with this, this, this form of depiction, um, you know, but it, there are multiple, multiple examples of this whole group of patrons that are also interested in these ideas um, and commissioning portrayals that, that resemble his. And we think that this one might be safer because she's dressed 
uh, but she might be actually more dangerous because there's sort of this representational likeness to a sort of magical image of Venus used in this form of astral magic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, the, the kind of cosmological correspondences are really absorbing, but I was just also thinking about, you know, the material, some of the links that you make with um, sort of Botticelli's ties to the silk industry in Florence. And I don't know if you want to touch on that a little bit. Um, it's sort of in another part of your book, but. Right, I was, it was really fascinating to kind of start to to understand that um, Botticelli's brother, uh, he worked for the Arte della Seta, which is the, the kind of guild of the silk merchants, and that he was a gold beater. So he actually beat the gold that they would then use to wrap around a saffron thread to create this golden thread that then they would weave into uh, particularly velvets or damasks. Um, and I can't zoom, let's see, I think I can see it. Even this detail here, well, a little bit, but there's this very intricate design in Venus's mantle that's woven um, from this golden thread. And then the golden thread that we see woven into her, um, also her white garment. So I was interested in, in how Botticelli was able to depict those material qualities of, for example, these golden designs or how he was able to depict transparent white silk and what materials he used and what techniques to try and capture um, this sort of um, textile that Florence itself was becoming famous for being able to produce these transparent, um, very kind of bright, um, almost light reflective forms of silk. Um, so kind of connecting it to the, the, old, the fashion industry in the city, Botticelli's connections to it, and yet also this iconography um, that was um, much older um, than the Renaissance in, in forms of depicting these planetary deities. Yes, and helping to kind of relocate Venus to, to Florence, not, not mm -hmm. um, as the kind of traditional idea of, of associating with, with, with Venice. So um, just looking through questions, um, going back to kind of our discussion about color and transformation. Um, and there's a question about um, malachite as, as a stone of transformation. Um, and um, they're interested to know um, the very first use of malachite. Um, and if it was used in a painting, or if you can tell us the, 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 um, the name of the painting and artist, if you know of it. Well, it's, yeah. to, um, it's used in Egypt, so we yeah. do find Egyptian examples of it. Um, and particularly Egyptian women were noted for having used it on their eyes. Um, and this may be why um, Aristotle connects it to being a drug for the eye, even though it was maybe used as a cosmetic. And there's some really kind of interesting interweaving between medicinal and cosmetic purposes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we do find it in some paintings um, from the Egyptian period. Um, so it goes back that long. Um, there are kind of, you know, some examples of it in earlier works of art. In manuscript illumination, there's like a very kind of clear differentiation between um, the use of like a mixture of um, lead tin yellow with blue, um, which are these kind of two colors, mm -hmm. um, and then a switch to malachite. There's also um, kind of some interesting research with the restorers and conservators that they found another form of malachite called spherical malachite um, that appears to have been a form of malachite um, collected from the runoff of copper mines that basically like water runoff um, and the water itself turns the stone into a spherical form instead of like the jagged form. Um, but it may be possible that with this new kind of popularity and desire for green landscapes, um, that new forms of malachite like enter the market. Um, another very weird thing I found was that in the, um, the lists of, of items sold by the apothecaries where you find all the pigments, Malachite itself is actually not listed. It is listed only as azurite, which is basically a uh -huh. twin. Um, and then, but in artists' own inventories, they separate separate the azurite from the malachite. And it is called in Italian verde azzurro or verde azzurro, green blue, um, because it's, it's separated from the blue stone. Um, so I thought that was also a kind of interesting point that 
you know, the malachite itself is connected to the blue and not always distinguished in the inventories, where you do find green earth and you find um, the verdigris. Thank you. I suppose um, probably got, um, we're probably um, running out of time. So just a final question um, on, um, uh, on your thoughts on Christine de Pizan's depiction of Venus, if you have anything. Um, yeah, I don't have the slide in here. Um, but I mean, her work is, is so interesting because she, especially coming out of this, this French courtly tradition, um, she doesn't put Venus so much on a pedestal and she actually tells Hector to beware, um, or, or not she, but like Prudence who's guiding him on this journey to beware of Venus. Um, and so she actually provides a nice contrast from like the romance of the rose um, and courtly traditions of love that are sort of pushing kind of chivalric love or love outside of marriage. Um, whereas with the Pizan and her work, she kind of says, beware of Venus because it can lead to idleness and lechery and all these problems. Um, and in her depiction, which I think is quite influential in those early representations of Venus as sort of a planetary deity, um, in the representation in her illuminated manuscripts of her text, where she actually gives directions for how to represent each of the planetary beings, um, she shows Venus kind of up in a similar kind of area of clouds and then there are all these little lovers trying to give her hearts you know kind of giving hearts to her um but you can see again in in that depiction also this kind of celestial image or this kind of cosmological figure of venus that is, is different from the mythological um and the the kind of de deity like aphrodite that we find you know, depicted in sculpture. So it's interesting merging in the Renaissance of these two traditions. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Rebecca. It's, it's um, tempting to, to, to sort of talk about this all, all evening. Um, it's been completely absorbing and enchanting and um, a really sort of sensorial conversation. And I, it was wonderful to, to see the, the uh, pigment demonstration too, um, and to kind of bring the magic of color and of Venus to, to life for us. So thank you so much for joining us and thank you to everyone for listening. And I do um, encourage you to, to look up Rebecca's book. And um, I know we put in the, in the Q&A chat box a link there to if, if you'd like to buy a discounted version, um, a discounted copy. Um, but yes, thanks again, Rebecca. Really incredibly vivid and uh, sense, sensory conversation tonight. So thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Claudia, for having me and having me speak about this. And it's been so fun, like looking at these correlations between color and the 19th century, which we're working on. Um, it's lots more to discuss. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Good night.